are the most important sites of the northern Levant. And you can see a tiny little bit of the southern Levant in there as well, with Hazor in the south, which uh, I included on this map because uh, it belongs to a northern Levantine cultural koine, at least during the middle or the middle to late Bronze Age. Um, when we uh, discuss Egypt, uh, Egyptian finds in the Levant uh, uh, during the Bronze Age, I'd like to quickly recall the later part of the third millennium uh, where we have evidence for first contacts, I mean, not first contacts, but like abundant contacts that seem to focus on two sites that you all know about, which is Byblos on the one hand, and also Tel Madih Ebla on the other hand, where uh, Egyptian finds were made. And of course, you all know about the so-called Byblos ships that are depicted uh, in the Temple of Saurei of the fifth dynasty, and also mentioned in other texts, which probably was a ship of a certain size of build technique that was used for overseas travel during the early kingdom. Um, this uh, is a, a map uh, indicating the number of Egyptian finds that were made at Biblos and Maldi Ebla. I don't know if you can see it too clear. I was not able to enlarge the figures, so I'm sorry about that. But what you can see is that in the course of the uh, Old Kingdom, of course, the imports rise. You have a lot of finds during the Sixth Dynasty, but also Fourth and Fifth Dynasties represented. And here you have the finds at Tel Madih Ebla, and they seem to match in a way chronologically. And recently, uh, Makona, or recently, it was already 10 years ago, I see, has uh, compiled and collected an inscription dating from the Sixth Dynasty of Ini, which mentions uh, Byblos, Kepan on the one hand, and also other sites in the northern Levant, apparently further inland of uh, the northern Levant, going into uh, Syria proper, if you will, that um, he uh, visited as a missionary and collected goods. And um, this is exactly what we have in the archaeological record. We have uh, 22 kilograms of lapis lazuli found at Tel Madih Ebla, and recently, Maria Joana Bigar has proposed the idea that in uh, several of the Ebla texts dating to the final phase of the um, uh, early Bronze Age site, uh, mentions a site called Dulu, which she interprets as reading as Gublu, which would then be Gubla, Biblos, and also people coming from uh, a region that is called Dugurasu, which she um, identifies with Egypt or a Delta site in Egypt. Now the name is elusive so far, and I have to mention that uh, further uh, older research has also interpreted this name Dugurasu as Tukrish, which would be in Iran. So it's not entirely clear, but what is clear is that the name Dugurasu always appears with people uh, from Dulu. So if you accept Gubla, then Dugurasu would perhaps you know, likely be identified as Egypt or people coming from Egypt. And um, this would also then perfectly fit with the evidence at hand, with the Egyptians doing trade with the Northern Levant um, through Byblos already during the later part of the third millennium or the later part of the Old Kingdom. What we don't have during the Old Kingdom is an emulation or an adaption of Egyptian motives at that time, at least what is known from the archaeological record. Now, during the second millennium, the earlier part of the second millennium, this is just the opening map, we do, of course, have inscriptions, historical inscriptions, like, for example, that of Nomhotep III, mentioning Byblos and also a site that is located further north along the Lebanese coast, Laza. And um, we also have the annals of Amenemhat II from Mitrahine, which mentions sites even further north and probably uh, Cyprus as well. And not to forget the execration texts, which are a bit more modest, but of course also feature uh, a number of names of Levantine kings and regions 
that uh, clearly show that trade was the main factor during the early part, the second millennium, uh, with Byblos and Egypt. Alexander? Yes. Alexander? Uh, Alexander? Yes. Who, um, bring up your, your uh, volume a little. Make I'm the volume a little higher. I think people are having a hard time. Okay. I think that's a little better now. Um, that's better now? I can't change the mic. I hope this is this perhaps move you. your hand away. No, but perhaps move your hand from the mic, and maybe that will go better without. I'm Don't holding the mic it beneath you. the see, mic. See how we how it works now. Does that work now? Okay. Okay, I'm trying. I think I can't, so. I, yeah. If I put it more closer to my mouth, I'll swallow it. So this is <laughs> I can't I can't change the mic in that way. So I hope it works for you. Okay, so Bublos in Egypt, um, of course, as you all know, uh, already during the Old Kingdom, as I've just shown, but also during the Middle Kingdom, of course, is well known by the finds of the royal tombs, of which one you see here, and also because of other finds that at times, uh, uh, you know, have to be interpreted as uh, highly Egyptianizing, but locally manufactured Levantine products that you can see here. Sometimes it's unclear whether it was actually manufactured by Egyptians or uh, locally at Biblos, or it was uh, manufactured by Levantine, Levantine craftsmen. That is an open question, but what is clear is that from the um, early second millennium on, we have an impact that uh, not only Egyptian imports are um, evident uh, at several sites in the northern Levant, but also an emulation, like locally produced, highly Egyptianizing artifacts are found now. Of course, at other sites in the northern Levant, uh, as you can see here, we have Egyptian imports that uh, are spread all over the place uh, from north to south, at, uh, especially at the most important Middle Bronze Age um, centers. And um, one you can see here, which is uh, recently found, also 10 years ago, I, I have to admit, is a stone vessel that belongs to a prince of the Middle Kingdom. And uh, others and myself have uh, ex written extensively about it. And uh, actually, we're all tired to hear about it. But it, it is becoming more and more clear that these objects dating to the Middle Kingdom actually come from looted tombs of the Middle Kingdom and were brought to the Levant at a later date, presumably at the end of the decay, the fall and collapse of the Middle Kingdom and the second intermediate period. And um, what you can see here is two maps, uh, one showing the distribution of royal finds from the Middle Kingdom versus the, uh, the objects that are non-royal uh, this includes uh, statues uh, and stone vessels of princesses, which belong to the royal household. And these are private individuals, if known by name, sometimes it's not clear, but it, clearly it's not royal. And you can see that the distribution is almost equal. So um, I would say that we argue for uh, looting of tombs, no matter whether royal or non-royal, because there's no way to um, differentiate between the different objects, royal or non-royal, but they're just found and sometimes found at the same places uh, at the same time without any differentiation. Apparently, so the Levantine rulers did not really care about whether this was a royal statue or was a non-royal statue, but of course it was uh, a foreign object that they accumulated in their places. And, and this is why they uh, opted for that. Here's a, a little scheme, unfortunately only in German. I didn't have the time to translate it, but it shows you that uh, we have, uh, uh, for these objects, we have uh, a sec uh, first f use, the primary use, which is the production in Egypt and the use in uh, tombs, temples, what you, whatever, what you will. And then we have the, the looting and then the secondary use, which it ends most likely sometimes uh, in uh, like a, a tomb in the Northern Levant, which is a secondary use, of course, um, and by way of inscription, 
uh, sometimes you can you know pin down the region where the objects came from in Egypt and almost all of the objects that we have found in the northern Iran actually well, those that have inscriptions um, clearly show that they come from a pure funerary or cultic context. Um, during the Middle Bronze Age, uh, in the course of the Middle Bronze Age, you also, as I said before, at Byblos, but also at other sites, two examples here, Tel Madih, which is this ivory uh, inlays that were found in the Middle Bronze Age uh, temple, and also the mural wall paintings, the highly Egyptianizing uh, Egypt, uh, uh, wall paintings found at Tel Saka, east of Damascus, but also I did have a picture of that at Tel Burak in the um, northern uh, in the southern uh, Lebanese coast. There is, of course, Egyptianizing motives that are integrated and emulated into the material culture of the northern Levant during the Middle Bronze Age. And then again, of course, uh, cylinder seals. You have uh, highly Egyptianizing cylinder seals. Unfortunately, most of them come from the art market. Some are from archaeological uh, context, but most of them are not, unfortunately. These are the uh, seals that are from Alalakh on level seven, um, but there are other seats as well that are on provenance, but you can clearly see that the style is Egyptianizing, but also, uh, of course, Northern Levantine that you can see here. Um, also, uh, because I'm not going to deal with it, but the introduction of the scarab seal to the Levantine cultures takes also place during the early second millennium BC, as is evidenced by the Bute jar in Byblos, and then later at several other sites. During the late Bronze Age, of course, things change. The um, city centers uh, um, dismantle. There is an evident change in political structure, not completely, but uh, of course, when you talk about Egypt and the Levant, the things are different in the fact that um, the pharaohs of the, the new kingdom now uh, partake in military expeditions uh, into the Levant, also into the northern Levant. Uh, some almost at a yearly basis, Moses III has to go to the northern Levant almost every year. And we know from the historical sources that there's two uh, sites uh, Kamadalos Kumidi and Sumor, which is identified with Tel Kuzel, um, uh, that there is Egyptian uh, personnel uh, stationed there, but apparently not permanently. And um, you can uh, detach from that that the influence of the Egyptians in the northern Levant, to cut it short, of course, this is a very uh, difficult and uh, thorough question, but the influence uh, of the Egyptians in the northern Levant was not as strict and dense as you would probably have it in the southern Levant. Um, what continues is trade. Uh, one uh, very peculiar find was a clay ceiling that has a scarab seal impressions with the name of um, Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV. Uh, which uh, was found in a dump that you've just seen. And this clearly shows that uh, trade continued. Uh, uh, of course, uh, you also have that in the historical sources. Uh, for example, the Amana letters, there is a huge long lists of uh, um, goods that were uh, taken from Egypt to the Levant and probably also goods, of course, going the other way into Egypt, grain personal people. Of course, we have these in tomb inscriptions and other inscriptions. And here's another set of seals that was also found in that dump, and they have clear uh, parallels in, um, in Amana. So it's not only one seal uh, that was uh, found there, but there are many seals that probably belong to one, probably to one, but it's not clear if there were several shipments of goods from Egypt can clearly hear the running gazelle motif that was found by Petrie and Amana, and also the Nefer sign in the middle. So these are exact parallels. These are from Katna and these are from Amana. Um, 
during the uh, New Kingdom 18th and 19th dynasties, you can see, this is another map showing the distribution, you can see that actually the focus seems to shift to the coast and um, to the important harbor towns, especially at Oshambra and again at uh, Byblos, and there are several other sites as well. But you see that the actual the focus gradually shifts towards the coast, um, which is also, I think, um, expressed in the historical sources. And um, that clearly shows that, you know, with the larger political entities during the Late Bronze Age, like Mitanni and Hatti, it became more and more difficult for the Egyptians to exert influence over the Northern Levant. And this also caused uh, the influence that uh, the uh, Egyptian culture, the Egyptian motives had on this region also to sink. Now, um, we have um, a lot of um, objects um, that are Egyptianizing, I would say, and uh, a lot of ink has been spilled on the terminology of uh, what this is all about. Uh, you can see a list of what uh, terms the, have been implied for this. I'm not going to detail about this, but we've seen just now that there is a lot of different uh, objects in within the material culture of the Northern Levant that clearly highlight Egyptian uh, motives and iconography and the wall painting cylinder seals and also these gold appliques with the peculiar Sematawi motif from the Late Bronze Age. But um, it is Mary Helm's uh, idea of uh, uh, the power of distance um, that foreign objects and symbols were transformed into ingenious symbols of power. Uh, also in always in case of the Egyptian finds here. And that created prestige among the Levantine rulers. Um, it's also that the Egyptian objects were conceived as exotica, if you will, and access uh, to these objects also um, gave prestige to the Levantine rulers. Um, uh, it is clear that the visibility of such objects uh, at palaces and then also in tombs was a prerequisite, and um, that's why we find most of the Egyptian finds in the northern Levant in the second millennium in elite context. That is, palaces of the rulers and the tombs, but none, I would say none, or very few in uh, anything that is not elite. In the local emulation and adaptation of, uh, of this uh, iconography, of course, served the ruler's demand for these objects because they are not so easy to get hands on um, if you count the, the finds compared to other finds. But it's also clear that the iconography was not entirely understood. You have pseudo hieroglyphs that Egyptologists tried to read but hardly make any sense. Um, so it's more likely that uh, real genuine Egyptian objects served as a prototype for these emulations on descriptions that were not clearly understood, but the emblems of power, just a clear writing of hieroglyphs served the Levantine rulers to uh, connect with the Egyptian sphere. Yes, and this is the so-called peer polity interaction model, which is quite old now uh, from 1986. But I think it served the point here that the different Levantine centers um, were in some sort of competition amongst each other to overdo the other. And the Egyptian imports in a way served to help, uh, you know, the, to fulfill this and by way of, uh, you know, the, the Levantine rulers uh, trying to come uh, compete for power over the other. And um, that is one reason why, first of all, the accumulation of Egyptian objects took place in the, the Levant. And this is also probably the main reason why Egyptian motifs were emulated and integrated into something that's uh, actually Levantine.
in the film culture. Yeah, I've said that mainly also already, but uh, yes, the visualization was a means of self-representation and a display of political power amongst the viewers. It started during the Middle Bronze Age, perhaps even during the Early Bronze Age, but the evidence that we have of fragments, fragmentary nature is not so clear. And um, it started this before any political impact, the direct domination that we have in the Late Bronze Age, and this any Egyptian, before any direct Egyptian political involvement in the Levant is evident. So the process is apparently not forced upon the Levantine rulers externally, but perhaps to be seen as a cultural discourse between the two regions, so that Egypt on the one hand and the Levantine rulers on the others, um, but chosen by the Levantine rulers themselves. And at the same time, um, it also served to foster ties and create marked differences among the ruling Levantine elites internally. So the difference that and this is very preliminary, um, uh, maybe uh, a ground for discussion is that there is difference, of course, differences, of course, between the Middle and the Late Bronze Age, or the Middle and the New Kingdom, um, which I have subsidized here, which uh, I think trade between the two regions is always the main factor, the driving factor that is behind all of this. Uh, in the Middle Kingdom and the Early Bronze Age, as we've seen, it's not forced upon the Levant. The Egypt is resource poor, poor in resources. So it was a vital to have access to the Levant and the goods that came through the Levant via Anatolia, Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, um, for example, Lapis Lazuli. Um, so in the Middle Bronze Age, uh, it was conducted by active uh, engagement on both sides uh, to uh, trade. In the Late Bronze Age, there was uh, Egyptian influence in the Southern Levant, uh, clearly with dominance uh, during, the, uh, during the New Kingdom, also in the Northern Levant, especially the coastline. But you can see that in the Late Bronze Age, there is less emulation of Egyptian motives, which comes as a surprise, given the fact that um, we have a much better set of historical sources, but that may be due uh, to the fact that the Levantine centers were sandwiched between the larger political entities at this time. So they're not free anymore. There was Mitanni after the collapse of the Middle Bronze Age culture, Koine, and later on, of course, Hatti, the arch enemy of Egypt in the you know, New Kingdom. So the emulation of Egyptian um, iconography was reduced. And also you can see the decline of Egyptian influence during the later part of the New Kingdom, beginning with the 19th dynasty in the Northern Levant, and the focus shifts to the coastal harbor towns. I've said that with Los Lugarit, and also of course the Southern Levant, while during the um, 20th dynasty, there's hardly any evidence except for Biblos um, for contacts between the uh, Northern Levant and Egypt. Yes, and I think that's it. Thank you very much. I hope you could hear me.